essentially, uh, as in your words, you uh, you democratized the privilege of global closed door conferences. So tell us about that. Yeah. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so I, I'm from China originally. I was born and raised in Qingdao, but my mom still works there as a pediatric neurologist. Uh, and you know, last year, uh, my mom got the first opportunity to go to an international conference in Chicago, uh, where she met another doctor from Dubai. It turns out, you know, they share the same rare patient cases, uh, and she was able to kind of learn from that doctor by talking with her and figure out what she wants to do with her own patient, which is, you know, life saving moment for people in her industry. <laughs> uh, but that was her first international conference after 35 years of medicine because it's just hard, so hard to get an opportunity like this, to get a visa, uh, and then finally be able to travel, take two weeks off. Uh, and she doesn't speak English very well, so the entire experience is very difficult for her. Uh, where that time I was at Stanford for business school, I just know a lot of doctors there. They just go to a conference pretty much every month next door. Uh, at one of the conference centers at Stanford. So they were able to have those conversations with other doctors very frequently. My mom has to wait for 35 years. Uh, and so that's kind of the reason why we started the company, is I was really thinking, is there any way we can democratize uh, opportunities to meet other like-minded people who share the same expertise and interest? Uh, and I believe it has to be through an, an event experiences, uh, but if we can digitize the whole experience, make it possible for you to meet new people entirely online, uh, then it, it can be much easier for my, my mom to meet other doctors uh, like that. So that's kind of why we started the company uh, around the world uh, around July last year. And it's been really almost uh, like slightly over a year. Uh, we launched in February, um, the week before COVID hits. Uh, and we instantly got a lot of interest uh, from people all over the world. So Xiaoyi, how did you get this idea? I mean, it was amazing that you, you know, started this pre-COVID-19 and already, you know, into this uh, online meeting, uh, online event platform. How come? Well, I was not expecting COVID. I mean, no one can predict that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, I was not expecting, but it turned out to be an opportunity, actually, right? <laughs> yes, I mean, we, we were not expecting COVID at all. And I, in fact, the problem happens to my mom. That was when she could travel, right? But it's, it's still really hard for her to travel that far. Uh, so, um, yeah, so, I mean, the, the point of, of, of the company has always been, how can we 100x the number of events happening in the world? If my mom can have, you know, 10 different events that she can go to, that she can meet other doctors instead of once a year, uh, then the world will be even in a much, much better space. That's always kind of being our, 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 our goal. But obviously, COVID hitch, which means even that one conference could not happen. Uh, that was something that I did not predict. Uh, but I still think that our company is not, it does not exist because we want to just replicate that one conference that got canceled because of COVID. Our company exists because we want to 10x, 100x the number of events and make, making it more frequently and more possible for my mom to make like-minded contact. Mm. So, Xiaoyin, uh, obviously, I mean, the world with visa restrictions and further, you know, with this COVID, uh, you know, a prolonged uh, I, I think a reduction of uh, global traveling numbers online is just inevitable. I mean, everything is going to possibly move online. So um, just a couple of months ago, uh, I was talking to students in China who studies in the U.S. and Europe, and they're saying, oh, I'm taking classes at home in China online. Well, that is a whole new experience for many. But the, you, I guess for your business, you are not the only one, right? We, we, in a way, all, both all of us, we, we're not the only ones who are capitalizing on this online space. What is your competitive advantage, say, in comparison to a company like Facebook? Well, I mean, I used to work at Facebook, and Facebook, right. is, <laughs> you uh, Facebook is a social network that tries to connect people uh, who have already known each other, right? So they're a great platform for you to keep in touch with people you know, uh, with my friends, with my family. Um, that's what Facebook's really good at. That's not the space that we're trying to compete in. We're trying to help people find new people who share the same expertise and same interests. Uh, and we're trying to do that in a synchronized manner, meaning there is a shared experience where everybody can be here at the same time. Um, so our product is not designed for you to use it uh, anytime. It's not like the product that you, when you sit on the toilet, you're, you want something to do, you will turn on around the world. Uh, most of our events are planned and scheduled. Uh, because we wanted to make sure that you have this really cherishable moment uh, where all the right people are here at the same time and you're able to interact with them. 
So I think fundamentally we're solving different problems, uh, but obviously Facebook is always the role model that I look up to because I had a great time uh, working there for three years. Mm. Tell us more about your business model. So are you hosting those meetings and events? Are you moderating them? Um, are you setting them up? Do you have, uh, you know, corporate clients, um, uh, private, you know, individuals? How does it work? Yes, we are a software company. So what we do is we enable uh, organizers uh, from all over the world to easily put together an event uh, that can bring people together. Um, that means we have a lot of different kind of templates. You can do like a fireside chat template. You can do like an online cocktail party template. There's many different templates that as an organizer you can plug and play. Uh, and then the attendees and speakers can all uh, participate in that event based on whatever template you choose around the world. So we are the, uh, we're kind of like a digital, um, we're the digital venue plus the digital event planner uh, uh, for you. Uh, and really all you need to do as an organizer is you, you figure out the right topic for events and you bring the right people uh, and then you can choose from one of our templates to make your events possible. So to which extent are you competing with Zoom? Is Zoom a competitor, for example? Um, I mean, obviously people today are running a lot of the online events at Zoom. Uh, but I think Zoom was de originally designed to be a video conferencing tool. When they say conferencing, they mean you're in a corporate setting or you're in the same company. You want to be able to have those meetings every day using Zoom. Uh, or you wanted to do like your class uh, classroom at Zoom. So that's their kind of design for a uh, use cases where everybody already know each other. We're here to talk and get things done. Uh, that's not really the use case we're tackling. We're tackling the use case where people do not know each other yet but they share some similar interests and they're here for a limited amount of time uh, engaging really deep conversation that is not happening every day is something that you really cherish. So our goal is very different from Zoom. Our goal is to help you interact and make connections. with So other it's really kind of a matchmaking, social gathering, online party kind of thing. Um, yeah, I mean, the goal is to help you make new friends who share the same interests or same expertise. When I mean, you can't meet uh, physically. Well, Xiaoyin, uh, run the world. I mean, that's extremely ambitious. Coming from a young Chinese girl, I'm just incredibly uh, proud of, you know, what, what you stand for. But in a way, I would say that goes, uh, you know, the same uh, rationale perhaps goes for Pony Ma or uh, Zhang Yiming as well. They all, in a way, you know, uh, want to run the world. So they run into problems. In this increasingly bifurcated world, how do you run the world as a whole? Um, well, <laughs> we started the company in the probably the most <laughs> crazy period of the world. <laughs> I think normally when there's a lot of changes happening, uh, there's more opportunities, right? So like uh, if you think about how Alibaba was started, it was doing SARS, and uh, a lot of the company, uh, Airbnb, was started during the economic depression. Uh, in 2008. So for us, I think that COVID is a crazy time, but it also brings new opportunity. Uh, it kind of makes people all of a sudden all use video every day at home. It makes it normal to video chat with somebody that you don't know. Uh, I think those are the things that we believe are unlocking new opportunities. And, um, and we're really lucky to, to happen to be at the right place at the right time. But still, in a bifurcating world, I'm going to draw you on this issue. How do you incorporate China fundamentally with the markets of the West and essentially put the, the two sides together? Well, I mean, I think the, the space we're in is we digitize events. Um, and there's always been international conferences that people from China, U.S., and all over the world are participating. We're not trying to, we're not, we're not a friendship app, we're not a dating app. We're really focusing on providing knowledge uh, and, 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 and really connect the professionals who share the same expertise together. And that has always been, no, no matter like what the situation economically or politically has been, there's always been uh, physical events that connect people from all over the world. You're saying basically uh, the communication between China and the West it should not, not stop. It should continue either online or offline. I mean, it's really hard to stop, right? <laughs> How can you stop a, uh, like doctors from sharing real patient case to each other? Um, how can you sh uh, stop technologists from sharing ideas? Uh, how can you stop Nobel Prize winning uh, scientists from different universities to engage in research together? I think it's just um, obviously as a social media app that provides entertainment for people, you could say you can ban that. But uh, when you wanted to really have 
doctors work together to fight against a rare disease um, is really for the whole humanities. I, I don't believe that you can easily stop any of those collaboration because they are always been happening. Uh, if you look at the history, whether it's during <laughs> crazy times, crazier time than today, uh, those collaborations in different academic fields and different uh, expertise has always been happening. So you I think don't think there is a possibility one day when they run the world that becomes as big as Facebook. So, for example, the U.S. government is going to come and say, or equally, maybe Chinese government. I'm just saying any government could come out and say, hey, uh, you're not allowed to operate in a certain markets. Uh, well, so we, are, uh, we started in um, Mountain View, um, and uh, we, I mean, I'm pretty lucky that I had a lot of experiences. Uh, working in the U.S., so we got funded by the, so we're really a U.S.-based company right now, but obviously started by Chinese. <laughs> um, so I think that's a, it, it, it's actually quite uh, quite common now in Silicon Valley where you can have Chinese-born founder or, you know, Chinese-American founders uh, starting company and get funding at Silicon Valley. So I think that's just, so it seems to be like that's a pretty new trend, but it's definitely a growing trend. I've seen more Chinese founders getting funded. Um, by like top VCs in the US. With uh, the rise in cyber attacks and hacking and so on, uh, what kind of measures are you taking to protect yourself against any kind of data breaches? Yeah, I mean the fundamental things that, that we do is we're not trying to be a public event space that everybody can participate. I think the whole point about making sure that events are relevant is making sure the right people um, only the right people are showing up, right? So like, uh, only by knowing, if my mom knows this event is gonna be attended by a uh, like-minded pediatric neurologist who has the same expertise as her, uh, and who has probably similar type of experience as her, then she knows that she can have really deep, meaningful, engaging conversations. So, so there seems to be a really exclusive membership uh, selection criteria, is it? Uh, well, it's not necessarily exclusive. I mean, it's, it's relevant, right? So it's not necessarily we're saying you have to be a millionaire in order to attend one of them. We're saying this is an event that talk about really deep topic, topic in pediatric neurologists. Uh, you need to understand what this event is about, what the, what the research is about, to be able to engage in conversation. So I think to some degree, yes, it is exclusive. Uh, but it's exclusive in different dimensions depending on the events, right? Sometimes they're all college interns who have interned at a tech company. Sometimes they're all, you know, uh, black bloggers in British, uh, in, in Britain, where they all share the same passion. Uh, and some of them are all immigrant, you know, who are kind of figure out the H1B situation for their work. So it's not necessarily exclusive as in you have to be rich enough to pretend, participate, but it is curated enough that um, you know that they're not going to be random person on the street bumping into this events and just, just hack it, right? So like it's the fundamental design of what we do is private. Uh, is not trying to be the next Facebook or TikTok where anybody can see anything. Because I don't believe that uh, it's really helpful for people to engage in deeper conversation if you don't know who you're talking to. Mm -hmm. So I think fundamentally we're designing a way that is optimizing for uh, kind of the interaction between people during that event uh, than the time spent or the most amount of viewership. Uh, I think that's fundamentally kind of uh, different and events. actually, one event that we are going uh, to use your software and run the world for is uh, the Horasis Global Meeting on yes. October the 1st Great. because we share one common friend and the organizer of the Horasis uh, Global Meeting, uh, Frank Jürgenrechter. So, yeah, we'll see how that goes and test your, you know, software and technology to the maximum. Thank so, you. Yes, yes. So that, that's a great example. Uh, those are all people. Uh, uh, we, we did another event with Horizons. It was it was in India, where most of the India CEOs and the you know the, the kind of the government officials are here at the same time, uh, talking about the trending issues uh, that India is facing. Uh, and it was a pretty curated group of people that that kind of all understand India inside out, and, and is mm -hmm. and, and kind of directly responsible for the policy changes in India. So I think those are the use cases that we really. Uh, we're really tackling. So fundamentally, we are a choreographer, we are a social company, uh, but we're not trying to be the social media company per se that you, you, you maybe kill some time with. Uh, we're trying to be the social company that drives meaningful uh, societal changes, whether it's scientific research, uh, or is ideas exchange, or policy uh, improvement uh, for society. 
you know, a lot of uh, Chinese uh, uh, startup projects are actually funded by Silicon Valley, but just in a general trend, because you are right in the epicenter of this. How do you see uh, Chinese capital coming to Silicon Valley now? Has that been stopped? And uh, where do you see this, uh, you know, Chinese companies continue to, uh, to be further restricted on, uh, you know, essentially uh, listing in the capital market in the U.S.? Where, where do you see this whole, uh, you know, chain of uh, global capital flow in the technology space going forward? So I think, I mean, uh, for, for me personally, I, I've seen France uh, got funded by either Chinese capital or U.S. capital or Singapore capital or <laughs> Europe capital. So I've seen Chinese uh, or Chinese born people or Chinese Americans get funded by all kinds of capital. Uh, and normally when my friends are choosing which, which capital uh, to take, uh, I think there's a lot of things that they take into consideration. Uh, the most important thing typically that I find is, uh, is the VC or whatever the founder that is align with them on a mission level. And it turns out it's actually quite hard. It's very, really hard to find venture capitalists that shares the same mission uh, and, and has the same goal as you. It's actually very difficult. So typically when I see people getting funded, that is the number one thing they care the most, at least among my friends, uh, especially if you want to do something super ambitious. Uh, not all funders are uh, align with you. Right? Some of them may think this is too ambitious, uh, the risk may be too high, and they prefer you go, out, go with some business maybe with more clear cash flow and more clear uh, kind of uh, expectations. They know kind of what to expect, but they don't want you to be the next Facebook. They want to maybe be the next bill, uh, unicorn. That's good enough. So it's actually quite hard to find uh, an investor who share the same uh, goal as you uh, and who you trust. So normally when I find uh, my, my, my friends who are Chinese born, Chinese Americans, that seemed to be the number one thing that people consider mm -hmm. is like, do I trust this investor? Uh, can they really support me uh, towards my mission? Are they going to fuck me over if I, you know, <laughs> things don't get well, <laughs> well if, if I'm facing some challenges? Uh, that seems to be the number one most important thing that, you know, everybody cares the most. Right? Uh, and then when number one goal is like, okay, we're aligned. I think then you obviously consider policy in versus like, oh, the government policy is going to change. We have regulation sure. issues. Obviously, you consider that as part of your equation too. Uh, but from my understanding, from talking to a lot of founders, uh, it's like simply finding the, the investor who share the same value and mission as you and that you deeply yeah. trust, uh, yeah. especially during the challenging time, has been like hard enough <laughs> that it normally takes a lot of soul searching uh, to find the right person. So that's kind of what I, what I find. And then, and then obviously the policy changes, uh, does change, but normally when you start a company, you're not doing this for the next one year, you're doing this for the next 10 years. It's just so hard to know, like, you know, what's going to happen uh, in 10 years. It, it sounds like right now we're pretty tense right now. Today, you don't know what's going to happen in five years, don't know what's going to happen in 10 years. So normally the funders that I know are probably have done this before. They are taking into consideration the 10 year horizon, uh, which a lot of times the policy became something that's kind of, uh, you just don't know what's going to happen. So we but do by launching, you know, around the world as Xiao Yin, you do have some prediction uh, of the future skills for sure, because you could kind of sense, you know, that something big is coming. So you do have a little bit of prediction talent for sure. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah, I mean, policy is really tricky, but uh, normally I, I'm counting on more like my gut feeling about if the investor is trustworthy. I feel like that's something. That Probably easier for me to predict <laughs> than well, policy. That's, uh, well, well, that's really not in entrepreneur's DNA, I think. You know, everybody's good at uh, different things. But let me go back to your uh, my original question, actually. I love yeah. your fascinating answers. So money is money, right? Money, everybody's money is money. There, especially underneath it all, it doesn't have it doesn't have a uh, identity difference. But uh, Silicon Valley now increasingly are getting cautious about Chinese money, right? I think, you know, I don't, I don't know much about the Chinese entities getting funded. That's not my expertise. I do know a lot of Chinese funders, meaning like the, the founder themselves uh, are Chinese born or they may have ties to, uh, you know, their families from China. I know a bunch of, the, of those people. Uh, I think that's a very different type of situation than uh, maybe a Chinese entity doing things in the U.S. Those are kind of two different things. Uh, and most of my network uh, have been the Chinese funders, meaning they're Chinese born funders and um, they either come here for school or they work here, maybe at Facebook and then decided to start a company. 
so uh, from, from those cohort, I cannot speak for the other cohort because I don't understand that space, uh, but from the space that I do understand, uh, I don't really see that many difference in terms of the, themselves getting funded, uh, whether that's by uh, American capital or by capital outside the U.S. Uh, so, so far, I haven't seen somebody who has a great idea uh, and has the right team not getting funded. Those policy changes. So you're in your first uh, fundraising phase right now, Xiaoyin, um, mainly fundraising in the U.S. What about capital raising in China? I mean, the VC landscape is obviously very, very different, but would you consider that as well? Um, I'm considering what? whatever money that I believe is the right money for me. <laughs> and cooking, uh, right? Which sometimes means a lot of different things. Uh, but uh, for, for me, uh, our fundraising is kind of different. Um, the first round was was pretty quick. We got a few competing offers. Uh, when we actually once you get, it's really hard to get the first check. Obviously, it was definitely hard for me as well. But once you get the first check, uh, for me, it is like I need to make a decision in the next three days after I got the first check. And then I was having a bunch of other conversations, and then they all like rushed. And you know, when you get funded, the, the first check, all the other investors suddenly like. Wow, there's so exactly. It's like an avalanche, right? <laughs> Chain so, effect. So we have three days to decide, and at that time it was kind of crazy. And then there was, and, and the, we have three days to decide if we're going to take the first offer. Um, then we got a bunch of other offers during those three days. So for me, it was more like, like I don't, I'm no, I'm not going to have time to talk to like all the capital because I literally only have three days. So I'm just trying, to, and then I don't want it to like the offer is pretty good on the table, so I don't want to drop that. Right. So for me, it was more like, oh, I have three days. Uh, can I get a better offer than the first offer? If if yes, I would take it. You know, if if no, this is a pretty good one. So it was it was very different for me the first time. So the first fundraising was more more like that, uh, and then the second fundraising was the Series A. Uh, it was right after COVID. It's like months after COVID. So then, then, you know, obviously we have a lot of demand. So it was also different. It was weird. It, it was different. Like where it's more like investor wanting to invest because they, they, they kind of realized maybe the COVID will last longer or maybe there's going to be consumer changes that have happened longer term. So they have more conviction uh, than when we first raised. It was like we have to persuade people online events is going to be something that people probably even want to give a try. People don't believe in us, uh, but then in, during COVID, it's like you don't need to explain, right? You just you just show them that you have the exact solution, and like everybody just punning at your door. So that was a weird time for me. It was, it was probably too lucky that that like all of a sudden everybody's interested uh, before I wanted to raise, so they just come to me, uh, and then you know they give me different offers, and obviously a pretty good ones, so and I I take it. So that was a not a typical fundraising. Uh, process for me and I do not expect me to be this lucky uh, for the next round so <laughs> I'm prepared I have some I'm mental sure. it's not going to be this Shaima, easy Shaima, <laughs> we talked we started the show talking about your motivation to start running the world but uh, I'd like to close uh, with a question about your mission you talked about the mission a lot if you have one sentence to tell the world what exactly you want to do what would you say uh, well, the mission is really for anybody with any interest or expertise, no matter where they're from, uh, they're able to meet like-minded people and ma make really meaningful conversations. Uh, and the, the vision that we think about it is that it, in 10 years, we believe the next Nobel Prize winning uh, research will happen around the world because the, the scientists get to meet each other around the world. Uh, they get to talk about their ideas and socializing with other scientists around the world. Uh, and they get to ex collaborate and working in a bunch of paper draft around the world. Uh, and they're able to connect to the businesses or industry that can use their paper and their research around the world. Uh, and then they ended up making it so impactful that they won the Nobel Prize winner. Hopefully that ceremony can also be happening around the world too. That's kind of the way we think about around the world.